Today we are going to talk about cities and women. Why is it important? Because there are many challenges around the globe for women in cities, especially in big cities, mega cities, etc. And they can be safety issues, it can be transportation issues, public spaces. So today we have two very important speakers with us who will talk about Madrid and also about Vienna. And from, uh, from Madrid, we have Silvia, Silvia Roldan. She is the Vice Minister for Digitalization for Madrid, but a former CEO for the Metro de Madrid. So definitely you can imagine what we will talk about. And we have also Ursula Bauer, and she is going to talk about gender mainstreaming, which I will definitely ask the question, uh, but welcome both of you. Um, so you are here because we will talk about your best practices. So congratulations for that. Uh, I would like to start with Silvia, and I just want to understand your current role, Silvia, because you are in the digitalization vice ministry role, so that's excellent. And also how this role helps all citizens, genders, and especially women. Thank you. So, well, thank you very much for inviting me, uh, me to participate in this amazing uh, global summit. For me, well, I come in here and I think, wow, wow, it's fantastic. So, well, it's, it's the best place to be here today in this uh, amazing city. So, welcome to Madrid. Uh, well. So, um, thank you very much to be with me in this roundtable. For me, it's absolutely an honor to participate and to share this roundtable. So, well, Ursula, as you told and you said, I am currently the Deputy Minister of the Government uh, for Digital in the community of Madrid. And uh, this is the sole council in our community that exists in Spain. And our main goal is to accelerate the digital transformation of the public services to improve the efficiency, the transparency, and the accessibility of the public services. But please give me only a few, few uh, seconds to enumerate our main objectives. First, we want to increase the automation of all the public services, making them accessible for everyone. We want to reduce the unemployment, focusing on teaching everything of these new technologies. We want to increase the attraction of talent and investment. And we want to ensure until 40% contribution of the GPD of the community of Madrid. And obviously, we want to achieve these goals, promoting the responsible use of their technologies because for our government, it's very important to assure the respect of the ethical values, especially if we are talking about the AI. So today, the new technologies can help us to create a most equal cities. This means creating solutions that take into account the specific needs of women, such as apps for personal security of services that supports working mothers and entrepreneurs. We are committed to eliminating any gender biases in our algorithms and data collections, ensuring that women and girls have the same opportunities. New technologies can be powerful tools for promoting gender equality in cities, but they are also face a number of challenges that need to be careful address it. Okay, but how new technologies can help us to create these better cities for women? So for example, they can facilitate the access to the education and information. For example, with the online education platforms that can be accessible for everyone, more accessible to women, to women especially those who might be limited or by family responsibility or social barriers. 
we can use technological tools such as mobile banking application and e-commerce platform enable women to start and manage business from home. And this is, can especially be especially significant in areas where women may face restrictions of working outside home. Obviously, my sector, we can improve urban safety using, for example, a smart lighting system in public areas in order to improve women's safety in cities and apps that allow location sharing with family or friends can also contribute to safer environment. Social networks and online voting platforms facilitate women's participation in political and community processes, helping to ensure that their voice, our voice, their needs, our needs, and opinions are considered in decision making. Other example in the access, uh, is the access to the health system, the health services. Here in our community, we have developed an ambitious project called Virtual Health Car. This project allows our citizens to have their personal health history in the mobiles. And for women, it is now possible to make an appointment to have a mammogram or track of the pregnancy drawn through their mobile. But obviously, everything is not positive of using the new technology. So we need to uh, speak about the difficulties and the, the challenges that we can uh, have using this kind of technologies. But only I want, because I think that it's a very good day and we need to speak uh, in a positive way, I only uh, to speak and uh, uh, to enumerate two. The first one is the digital gender gap. Women often have less access to technology and fewer digital skills compared to men, which can limit their ability to benefit from these technologies. This gap is bigger, especially in rural, in rural areas. And the trending topic, the AI, the AI, so bias in technology. Biases in technology. So many technological tools have been designed and developed with taking into account, without taking into account the specific needs for women, which can perpetuate inequality or even exacerbate it. For example, AI algorithms can perpetuate gender biases if not trained and critically evaluated. So, and I close. So, in summary, although we have to address these difficulties, I am absolutely, absolutely sure that we have the opportunity to have better citizens for women using the new technologies. Thank you so much. This is uh, actually a great connection with the previous sessions. In the last couple of sessions, we talked about AI technology, the positives, and also the, the challenges we might face. But we will come back also to how to have more women in the technical fields later. But before that, I want to ask Ursula about the gender mainstreaming. What does it mean? How do you bring this gender lens to everything you do in Vienna? Well, thank you for having me here. This is really a great pleasure. And thank you especially to Irene, who made everything to convince me to come here. <laughs> uh, so when you think of Vienna, you might think of a pretty old, pretty imperial city. Everybody thinks of when you think of women in Vienna, maybe the first one you have in mind is Empress Sisi, this rather unhappy woman and this is what unfortunately is not happening now anymore. We did not only change to a more democratic society but also society changed and women have a different stay in society. And so our city councillor for women's affairs put it very clear. In Vienna we want that every woman can lead an independent life, an economic independent life and a safe life. And to do so as a city government, as a city administration, what you have to do is to take a multidimensional approach. And in this respect, gender mainstreaming, a strategy that comes from the UN actually, and the development policies and uh, the EU, makes it quite clear. You have to keep in mind that 
gender differences and gender inequalities may happen everywhere. So when you think of a city, what can a city do? Well, a city provides the built environment, which is crucial for the way you go through the city. As you said, it's mobility. Do you have access in the same way as men to public transport? Do you have access to streets and parks and leisure uh, infrastructure in the same way? Well, officially, yes, legally, yes. But then think of all the invisible barriers you have to face because there is sexual harassment, which is even in a great city like Vienna, it's taken place, you know, it's, and uh, it's all, always and everywhere, and you have to be aware of that. And then, of course, you provide housing. You, there's an immediate need for social and affordable housing, especially for women and other vulnerable groups. What else do you need? You mentioned it, it's the health system. And there is a big need to have a differentiated lens on the health system from a women's and a man's perspective. And also, when I talk about safety, what you need is safe places for women. Whenever you get in troubles, there have to be enough places in safe houses. And so Vienna is offering five places for women really to be safe and one especially for girls. So there's a lot you can do. And of utmost importance, apart from the planning we're going to talk about later on, is take into account care work and take women's lives really uh, and, and their living conditions serious. Because when I say care work, care work is the basis for economic independence. If you do not offer as a city sufficient and low cost, high quality care for kids, you won't get the women in the labor force. So you can do whatever, you as, a, as corporates, I've been listening to you in the morning and also already yesterday, it's great what there is happening, but still if the government and the city is not offering enough childcare, and you can be sure of that, it won't happen. You won't get the women labor force. And uh, so the city in Vienna is offering childcare free of charge for all the zero to five year olds, and you will be sure to get a place. And 90% of all kids are attending childcare in Vienna. So this is really a great thing. Ooh, that's great. <laughs> I'll tell this our Chief Executive Officer for Finance. <laughs> because when I'm talking about, you know, this is already called, you have to keep in mind that when the city of Vienna is a big, is a city with a 19 billion budget, and one billion of this is dedicated to child care. So do that, invest this money, but it pays off. So this is also a message I want to tell you. We had an economic study on that. And what we clearly could see is it pays off. The more money you invest in childcare, the more money you invest in women, you get it back because women go to the labor force, you have a higher GDP, you, it has an impact on your GDP. And of course, also you can invest in, in economic independence. And so the last point I want to make is when you're spending money as a city, as a contractor, and as a, for when you're giving subsidies, it is important also to link that to gender equality. Because gender equality, when you spend the money, you can tell the people, listen, we give you the money as a corporate, we can give you the money as a startup, but you have to make sure that part of this money is spent on the improvement of the working conditions for women. You have to show, do you attract enough women? Do you have a policy against sexual harassment in place? And also, you get extra money, you know, it's the carrot and the stick, all as everywhere. <laughs> so you use the carrot and you tell them, okay, if you can prove that there is a Women leading the project, you want to get subsidized by the city, you are giving ex given extra money. And, but you have to make sure that this is not just, you know, some try to be very intelligent and to show us, well, we have a secretary. <laughs> of course, this is not the point. The point is you have to show that you have high qualified women and that you keep them. And this turned out to be perfect. So the thing is, it's education, it's investing money in the right things, and it's important really to make the city a safe place for women. And so to do so, you have to have gender budgeting in place. You do not only have to have the backing of the politicians and the senior management, but you have to do gender budgeting, which means that whenever one of our, uh, of our city departments is spending money, once a year at least, they have to think the way I spend the money, do I get my target groups? Do I reach the groups I want to reach? And this means Gender differentiated data, as we already mentioned, it's utmost important to get gender differentiated data, which seems quite clear, but is rather difficult to achieve sometimes. 
and you have to analyze it in that way, and you have then to think, what can I do in case I discriminate against women, and what can I do to really to contribute to change the city? Because the whole thing is, and I'd like to quote here Iris Bonnet, you might maybe know her, she is a very well-renowned behavioral economist at Harvard, and she said the whole thing about gender mainstreaming is fix the system, not the people. Thank you so much. So as you speak, thank you. I started thinking like this is a product or a service management. Uh, everything starts with design thinking. You have to have a target group, insights, understand those, and then come back with some budgeting, financial analysis, return on investment, ROI. So it's the whole thing, basically. And you will talk more about it. But I want to go back to Sylvia and talk about the transportation, which is a very important aspect of safety in the cities for especially women. Uh, she spent many years, 20, I think 20 years plus, right, in the, in the transportation systems in the cities. So let's hear from you what were the initiatives you have taken to make sure women were safe. So well, believe me, that's all the conference that I had in my last sector, I begin with the same uh, phrase, exactly. Public transport is the backbone of the cities, everything. All, all the, all the uh, conference, I begin like that. But today I want to say anything more important, that uh, it's the backbone of an equal opportunity society. So accessible, unreliable mass transits allow people to live their lives by connecting them to sports, to employment, education, and essential services. So believe me that I work more than 20 years in this sector, this amazing sector, because I love the transport. Uh, the new technologies is currently my, my sector, but by, by I love uh, the public transport sector. And um, I tried to, to look for different data to put into context the importance of the transport for the citizens and for women. So I obtained this uh, data uh, looking in the source and the different research of the UITP. UITP is the International Union of, Tra of Public Transport. It's the most important organization that join all the citizen, cities, uh, companies, and everyone that uh, work around the public transport. So uh, uh, please give me only to, to put into context, give me, I, I'm going to show you the, these uh, key figures. Women rely on public transport more than men. You, of course, more and better public transport benefits everybody. Having said that, we must be clear that public transport quality and policies has an upside effect of women. And why? Because women take more public transport than men. 60% of women in the Middle East and North America North Africa feel that a lack of transport option reduce their ability to earn. If women participate in the labor market to the same degree as men, world GPD will jump by 26%. On average, around the 19% of public transport drivers are women. And women represent over a quarter, the 25 more or less percent of employees at the director and senior management level in this sector. So I work four years, the last four years in Metro de Madrid, like the CEO of the Metro de Madrid. And believe me that this is exactly the four percentage that you can find in the technical roles, in the senior and in the seniors and in the relators. Only the 25% of this position are women. So again, the technologies help us and will help us to provide solutions that allows for safe public transport. And I'm going to, to give you a different examples, and I'm going to, to enumerate different cities that uh, have different solutions. 
So, for example, mobile apps with safety features. So, uh, several ride-serving services have all women driver options and mobile apps with features like GPS tracking, in-app SOS buttons, and live location sharing with trusted contacts. Other solution is real-time tracking and location sharing. Location sharing allows friends and family to monitor a women's journey on public transport, providing peace of mind. Very important, improve lighting of public transport station and stops. Better lighting detects crime and makes women feel safer waiting for rights. Other solution, women only compartments in train in trains and buses. These compartments can provide a physical barriers and a sense of security for women's riders. And there are a lot of cities that uh, has implemented and did develop this kind of solution and uh, is well I, I only show a different uh, examples, but I think that it's important to, to, to think that uh, we are working for create safest cities for women. So for example, in New York, New York has implemented a program to improve lighting in subway station and allow bus routes. In Japan railways, Japan Railways had implemented women, women only train cars in some carriages during late night hours to provide a physical barriers and sense of security for female passengers. In Delhi, Delhi has focused on improving lighting in public uh, spaces, including the bus stops and train stations. Transport for London has launched campaigns to raise uh, awareness about bystander interaction. And an Egypt, an Egyptian government has launched public awareness campaign, especially targeting harassment and public transport. These campaigns use social media and public transportation displays to educate riders about appropriate behavior and reporting mechanisms. In Sao Paulo, for example, the city has implemented a, net a network of women-only bus stop and boarding zone of specific routes during the late night hours. And in Singapore, for example, has implemented a system with panic buttons on public buses that connect directly to emergency services. So, this is not only, we cannot solve, we are not going to solve, or we are not, we are not going to uh, improve or create citizen safer for women with only one measure. We need to combine environmental design change, technology, public awareness campaign, and strong policies that um, can significantly improve women's safety on public transport. So believe me, here in our government is uh, one of our goals. How can we implement different tools uh, in, the, in the transport? And also, how can we work with the different countries in order to improve and to help to follow and to, to develop this kind of solution in her country, in their countries? So thank you very much. Thank you. As, as you were speaking, I was thinking about my youth because I'm originally from Istanbul and, you know, it's not always easy to take a bus and not feel the physical touch of other people with intention, without intention. But, you know, I mean, that's, that's a concern that, of course, we want to take care. Or being in New York now, in the U.S., living in the U.S., I wouldn't go to certain places in New York it's late hours. I mean, that's still a concern in, in most big cities, so I'm very happy to hear your measures. Um, now, let's move to the public spaces, Ursula, and being an urban planner uh, originally and then spending so many years, 
So how do you design the public spaces so they are safer for women uh, during different hours of the day? What is the, again, the design thinking process? How do you make sure it's happening in the right way? Well, the design thinking process starts with taking women and their feelings seriously, because very often we are told the most, most unsafe place for women is their home, which is unfortunately true because 80% of all the sexual aggression against women takes place at home or in the close family. Nevertheless, if the public space is not safe, especially older women or younger women do not tend, are, are afraid of going out. And you know, this cannot be our aim as a city to say, well, uh, stay at home ladies. So uh, on one hand, you have to do surveys, you have to talk to NGOs, you have to listen to women, where do they feel safe, where do they feel unsafe, and you have to take this serious. And uh, when we started all this, it's almost 30 years ago, the first thing was to make women's feelings and women's needs visible, which means there was a big exhibition in Vienna, which for the first time, you know, I'm talking about 30 years ago, this is not the last, the, 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 the 200 years ago, it's 30 years ago, the first time we tackled the issue and we said, where well, do you feel unsafe? How do you use public space? What are your space patterns? And what do you need when using public space? And this means like they need more, women like to have more orientation and more orientation is very much linked to public lighting. And so the first thing we did uh, 30 years ago, together with my former head, who is a really brilliant uh, architect and urban planner, she hired a team of uh, landscape architects the first feminist landscape architects and a young uh, architect who had uh, her training in the US. And we tried to find out about places that did not work in Vienna. We then found out that if you show our colleagues, because what we want to do is to change the mind and the awareness of our colleagues who are working for the city, you know, all the technicians, the planners, be it women or men, and to show them how can they do better. And so the better approach was to look out for good examples and to change the ways the city is planned, which does really mean how can you sit together and get, get you know, better sidewalks, bro broader sidewalks so that you can evitate you know, some people. And I'd like to, I could tell you a lot of things, but you can read that all in the booklet we uh, published. But I'd like to come back to lighting and to public lighting and how to change the mainstream. Because the thing is, when you go out and you talk to the public lighting department, they will tell us, Oh, but there is a European standard. Don't worry, this will make the city brighter. And we said, yes, but when you look at this standard, this European standard only takes into account cars, buses, and tramways. It does not care about pedestrians. So, but who are the ones who are, you know, who don't feel safe or who, might, who do not have their own light as the cars? It's pedestrians. So you have to get in the idea of that people are using the street when walking and as you said already, it's mainly women who walk. Yeah? Women, two thirds of their, the ways they do in the city, they do by walking and accompanying all the people or accompanying their kids. So if you want to have safe streets, you have to make those, and in the, most of the time, these are, you're talking about technicians, I think 90% of them are men. They did not really care about that, or they said, yes, we do, and, but I don't, feel, I don't feel unsafe there. Or we had one technician, we said, okay, let's take us to a ride through the city at night. And he was standing there in the middle of the street telling me, but it's light here, why, why are you scared at the sidewalk? I said, yes, but we're standing in the middle of the street and the light of your car is on, you know? So <laughs> please st step aside and look at the sidewalk. So what we did then was we set up a training program for the lighting department and we developed together with them a checklist, you know, a very easy checklist, an Excel list. We maybe could switch now to <laughs> new technologies. At that time, it was an, uh, an Excel list and we said, well, we have 10 reasons for subjective safety feelings. And just think about, are there any social eyes in the street? Do women have to use this? Are there any, you know, you have special places in the city where you know it's a bit crampy and you have maybe some drug addicts around the corner. Everybody knows about that. So when you're doing a new lighting program in this era, please think when you plan, think about these 10 subjective safety feelings issues. And at the end we said, would you let your own young daughter or young son use this era, 
And this is, makes an issue because this gets them, you know, to their personal feelings and you have to get people's emotions when you talk about gender equality. And so whenever you have to tick these boxes and if there's a certain amount, you know, about 50% of them, you tick them, then there comes an insert and tells the people, please use the next lighting class and talk to your district, uh, to the, the district politicians to show what you can do to get here better lighting. And now I think I, I'd, I'd like to insist on this public lighting issue because in times of the climate crisis and in times of everybody talking about energy saving, it again gets a problem because people tell us the poor insects, the poor animals, the poor, I, I mean, I, I love animals, but I think first of all, there's human beings and I'd like to have my son or my, 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 my nephews and my nieces to go safe through the city. And so I think we have to think about you no know, life, stopping the, life, the, life, uh, the, the, the light smog and the light pollution, but we have to think about intelligent, new innovative systems, you know, be it LED lamps, or other ways how the lamps are shaped, but let's keep our cities with light, full of light. And the other thing is, the one thing is the public infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Yes, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> the, the public infrastructure, but on the other hand, you need counseling and you need emergency helplines. So the city of Vienna is promoting a 24 hours uh, emergency helpline for women who get sexually harassed. And when I say 24 hours, I mean it the, all the year through. So on every day, whenever you get harassed, whenever you get, in, get into troubles, you can call someone. There is an on-spot help, but there is also a companion to the, you know, all the, the procedure when going to the police, which is, has become much, much better now because there's also been training and officers are more aware, but it can be difficult. And to also take it to court, but who also offers, you know, long-term therapy and talks to your family environment. So this is really important. And on the other hand, what we're also doing is working with men and boys because they are the future also for gender equality. If you do not change the mind of men and boys and their attitude towards women and you stick with the old gender stereotypes, you can light the city, you can have uh, AI improvement of public transport, it will stay the same. So uh, there are special programs, training programs in schools. There's a special be respectful program in schools. And uh, there is also extra money now. The city is dedicating to uh, male perpet work with male perpetrators because you cannot only focus on the victims, but you have to change the <clears throat> really the mindset of those who are uh, acting aggressively. And unfortunately, in 99%, I'd say it's men. So you also have to change minds of men and boys. Great, thank you. So it looks like... Um you know, from the consumer lens, let's say, because I come from the consumer industry, you always need to represent your consumer in the workforce so you can deliver better results. I think it's the same in, in your teams. Can you have more women working in the technical areas or in design areas or urban planning? It is possible, but unfortunately you don't have enough. So do you have any initiatives, Sylvia, to make sure you get more women or girls in technical fields. Yeah. So again, let me um, give you a couple of figures, or key figures to, to put into context. Um, I, according to the McKenzie and Company report, women are significantly underrepresented in technical roles. For example, in the US technology sector, women occupy only about the 25% of technical roles. So companies such as Google, Facebook, or Microsoft very technological, uh, report that uh, between 20% or 30% the of their technical employers are women. Although these companies uh, have some uh, improvement in recent years, female, female representation in technical roles uh, remains low compared to non-technical roles. So obviously we have a problem. But um, um, what can we do? So what, what, what is the solution? So, well, so organization and companies are implementing a various strategies to improve the representation of women in technical areas. Well, not only the companies, the governments has the commitment to, to implement this, uh, this kind of solution. So, for example, mentoring programs and support networks. So establish 
mentoring programs that connect women in technical roles with leaders and mentors within the industry. These programs can also include support networks that offer resource, advice, and networkings, networking opportunities. Very important, education and training initiatives. So many companies and governments are collaborating with the universities and organizations to foster programs that increase the interest and preparation of women in technical fields from an early age. This includes, for example, school seats for STEM studies and cutting workshops or camps for girls. Equitable hiring and promotion policies, implementing policies that ensure more inclusive and equitable hiring and promotion processes. This may include reviewing job description to eliminate gender bias, ensuring diversified diversify interview panels and setting, setting specific quotas of targets for hiring women in technical roles. Inclusive corporate culture. Develop a culture, a corporate culture in the, in the companies that promotes in, inclusion and diversity. This includes diversity training for all employees. All employees, men include promoting a flexible, <laughs> a flexible work environment and implementing policies but that support work-life balance. I want to tell you, I'm not going to say the, na the name of the company, but I know that a very, very big technological company decide to implement um, an uh, algorithm using uh, AI uh, to help the human resource department to hire in the next processes of the company. And obviously, I, know, I don't know exactly what happened or what, what are the number of people that, uh, the technical people that decide to implement this, uh, this algorithm, but uh, use for, uh, for feed the algorithm uh, the last TB that this company has in the last 10 years. So imagine the different TB that the people that select this company to enter in the different position. The result is that the company discovered that the AI algorithm learned to select men. And why? Because the data that had fit the algorithm show that the 75% of the CV that the company includes or, or uh, uh, occupy the different position in the last 10 years was men. So we need to work in prepare and to, 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 to clear, to, to take care with the data of the using that we are going to use in the algorithms because we are going to perpetuate the biases of these algorithms. So the, the, the AI intelligence is not the problem. The problem is that we can work with the data to fit these algorithms. It's very important to put attention in, in this situation. And finally, I want to speak about the visibility of the recognition of the women. Increase the visibility of women in technical roles through awards, recognition, and opportunities for them is very important for the, for, the, for the girls, very, very important. So this is the reason, I think, that the Global Summit Women is the best, absolutely, the best uh, summit to show how there are a, lo a lot of leaders yeah. and their reference for the girls and for the teenagers, so we are the future. So please, please go on with this work. It's very important for us, for the young people. So, okay, so um, I'm going to, uh, to finish. Um, despite Ongoing efforts, obviously, the gender gap in technical roles uh, remains a significant challenge. So, 
Effective strategies require long-term commitment and collaboration between companies, educational institutions, governments, and communities to create a more equitable environment and real opportunities for women in the technical field. Thank you, thank you, Silvia. Uh, a quick, a quick, quick, quick poll in the room. Uh, if your background is STEM, science, technology, engineering, math, please raise your hand. Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> and of course, these days we can also add, you know, agriculture, arts, social science to this list because as we discussed these are all very important attributes architecture and all that stuff right so before we show our slides with a summary of recommendations and also resources because you might want to see them when you go back uh, a quick question to ursula on also recruiting more women so that they can help you to design better cities do you think is it something you are working on Sure. Uh, this is uh, of utmost importance to the city of Vienna. And since 1995, there is an Equal Treatment Act in place, which means that there is a, promote, a call for promoting women. And um, there is also a, um, a clear principle of non -equal, uh, to avoid non-equal treatment. And as soon as there are women underrepresented, to 50% to certain areas like STEM or, um, you know, uh, um, engineers, uh, and tech technicians, lighting technicians, then the departments have to show once a year what are they doing to attract more women. So do they transfer their work, their, their work, the work area? Do they offer flexible working hours? What do they do to attract more women? And so this is really something that is required from all the departments. Mm -hmm. And there is also a principle that says actually 50% of all leading posi positions should be held by women, which is not the case at the moment. So the city of Vienna with 70,000 employees has a percentage 60% 62% uh, of them are, are women who work for the city, 62% of all the employees, but only around 30, 32% of the leading positions are held by women at the moment, which is, you know, in the social departments and the education departments, of course, the percentage goes very high, highly up. But when you look at the technical departments, uh, well, we still have some work to do, I'd say. But there is a program, and what we also do is, you know, you have to start at an early age, but if there, because if there are no women who apply for the jobs, of course the departments cannot take candidates, women candidates, because if there are none, what should they do? So the city installed the subsidy program for the universities, which says that if you are applying uh, for money from the city, you have to make sure, and this is, you know, this is not a nice to have, this is something you have to show, what are you doing to attract more female students and as you said, what is really important is to make women visible. You also have to attract and to show your female professors because they are the role models. Yes. And so they are getting extra subsidies if they are setting up programs and if they are changing their programs. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, it's only, it's just the way you do your advertisement. Which you talked about marketing in the morning. And the thing is, if you have a flyer from the university where you only show, you know, the tough, strong men who are working as engineers yeah. and as IT uh, persons, mm -hmm, then of mm -hmm, course mm -hmm. women might not feel attracted because they are not shown and you don't address yeah. them. So this is really important to address women and again to make them visible. Okay, now let's get your phones ready because we will have the secret slides, okay? I know you like to take pictures. Okay, so Sylvia, um, it will be great for you to summarize your recommendations and your resources so people can, you know, take a photo, benefit when they go back. Please go ahead. So perfect. So I, I believe, okay. Uh, yes. I don't know if the, yeah, no. Yeah. Okay, then. So yeah, yeah, I think it's coming. Sylvia's coming. Just a minute. No, but it's no problem. So begin Ursula, no? But they... <laughs> <laughs> so, well, okay. So I'm Here going to is. speak about the new technology. Like, that <laughs> is my currently position. So you have to understand. But I think that the new technology is uh, something... This sector is transversal. So, well, 
it's, uh, it's important uh, to speak about uh, this thing. So, well, um, I try to summarize in two slides, only in two slides, because okay. I think that we need to focus on the benefits and obviously in the difficulties. Okay, so please, next slide. Oh, I think well, you need to worry. move it. Sorry, so, sorry. But <laughs> I'm moving it for you. This oh, is better. the one. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Well, before? Yeah, before, yeah. So we are one. Um, we are uh, talking about the benefits uh, because the new technology is facilitating access to education and information for women. Uh, is better for entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship and home based business management. Obviously, we can focus on urban safety, political and community participation, and access to health services. We can focus, obviously, in the difficulties. So, next, yeah. please. So, because we take, we have to take in account that less access to technology and fewer digital skills, technological tools not designed for women's needs is very important to focus in this. So we need more women design this and working with these new technologies and artificial intelligence algorithms can reproduce gender biases. I want to tell you that I I am absolutely committed with the implementing or the improve of the new technologies. This presentation, I, I prepared this presentation using AI, generative AI. So, well, it's, it's a way to show that everything is possible if the data that you have uh, to, to be the, the AI algorithm is, is possible. So, well, and for finish, I only want to say only uh, one thing for me. I'm very positive uh, women, so I, although we have a lot of difficulties and challenges, I am absolutely, absolutely sure that uh, now with the new technologies, we have the opportunity to have uh, better citizens for women. Absolutely. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. Uh, I think a lot of knowledge, experience, passion, energy. So Madrid is very lucky. <laughs> Great. Okay, the next and the final piece is coming from Ursula, a summary of what you uh, recommended, please. So I'd like to conclude with a one, I'd like the first slide of my conclusion is a quote by a German architect who says, well, don't wait for the revolution. You know, revolutions may, may be also difficult, but the, Women's idea of utopia is effectively the subversion of everyday systems becoming manifest in 100,000 small things. So it's not the one big issue that might change the world, but it's 100,000 tiny little pieces. But the sum of the subverted elements would create totally different cities. And so just get started. And this is, if you show the next slide, so if you are planning and focusing on a city on gender equality, the first thing that you can do as a city official, as a representative of the government, what you can do first of all is give backing to gender experts. You know, setting up a gender equality support structure. I could not do that if I would be alone, but we have, I'm the kind of the city equality watchdog in the chief executive office, but I do have a network of gender experts all over the city with a very strong women's department that is giving money to emergency help for women, that is taking out surveys, that is really doing great studies. And on the other hand, you need women in all key areas, like in housing, in economy, in the, the field of technical advice, you need women in the health sector and wherever it is, because you know, I, as a gender expert, I can give the ideas and I can follow up the projects, but we need to do translation. And you need to have translation to the technicians and to the, to the experts. And this is why you have to have multipliers, female, most of the time female, but also male multipliers that help you to get the gender idea where it is needed. For example, in the budget sector. The next thing is get informed about gender gaps. As I already stated is you need gender differentiated data and statistics to make discrimination visible because you know, you as corporate leaders, you know very well that what you can't measure, you can't change. Yeah. 
then it's all about the budget. And this doesn't necessarily mean extra money, but it means think carefully when you spend money, what can you do to change it in a better for gender equality. And this is why we do have a gender budgeting team installed right in the financial department so that those who are responsible for the finances are also responsible for gender. And the last thing is get started and change the system on the long run. You know, pilot projects are great. Whenever you have a project, just jump on it. When you change a street, when you change a park, when you change your subsidies, go in and look for gender equality. But if you don't change the system on the long run, if you don't, for example, if we didn't have worked with the lighting department, it would have get stuck with one or two pilot projects. You can't end up with pilot projects. You have to change the system. And uh, in the last slide, what you could uh, take with you is, uh, we have unfortunately very little material translated to English, but we have some important ones. So this is a guideline, gender mainstreaming made visible, which helps our colleagues uh, and gives them advice and you know, very easy tips. What can they do if they, for example, plan a conference? And like uh, you said, with the technicians and with the AI and the digital world, it's hard to find women, but you can find women. And for example, our uh, chief information officer, he mm -hmm. refuses to sit on panels that are men only. He says, I'm not going yeah. on a panel if there's not one or two women on it. <laughs> yeah. Excellent, excellent. So He'll I be think happy are... to know that he gets applause from women. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. And again, Vienna is lucky they have you. Thank you so much.